My name's Theo. Um, I'm the chair of the Enfield Youth Parliament. I've been there for three years. Uh, super passionate about Enfield and young people, the two topics. I'm like an itch you can never scratch in that forum. Uh, I've been there for quite a while and I hope to continue doing it. Uh, climate change, for, lot, for all the time I've been there, so that's been three years now, has been at the top of our agenda. Uh, for young people, it is absolutely important. Every day, every minute, every second, we get closer to the point of no return. The point in which we can no longer act. And for young people, this is actually very scary the, because it's the point which we can no longer have the chance to make a difference. And to a lot of us, this will be actually when we actually reach the age of adult, adulthood. The point in which we can no longer stop our planet from dying. But despite getting even cl ever closer, we have not yet come to that point. We will, ha we will still have time and we still have a chance. And that's why as young people, we feel obliged to get involved. And that's why we're here today. We all, we've all heard of climate change, but what exactly is it? Enfield Young uh, Youth Parliament has pushed that this is something that needs to be taught a lot more, not just in schools, but to older generations, community clubs, etc. Um, and that's hence why they've created, Enfield Youth Parliament have created a sort of curriculum for life to try and encourage not such academic studies on it, but more practical real life. How is this affecting us in life? Um, it's a program that has been created uh, with the climate change as a fundamental component of it. However, for the reason that I'm actually actively encouraging to mention the fact that it needs to be taught more of, I'm going to go over exactly what the young people think are definitely the most important parts of it and what, how we see it. Because to us, climate, global, uh, global warming is a form of climate change and is seen as a process of the earth healing itself. We know that in our lifetimes alone, so this is my lifetime, it's 19 years, our, um, our earth has... Um, has a warmed an average of one degree Celsius. And this seems like a massive, it seems like nothing really. Uh, however, we are at risk at losing four degrees Celsius by 20, uh, 2050. And it has had a high impact on us in our lifetime, as well as around the globe, because that's what we see as young people. We see a responsibility to help abroad as well as just here. As our climate changes, it makes our weather more extreme and unpredictable. And we have seen this in the Atlantic literally really recently with the recent hurricane Nana and in some reg regular more devastating floods in India. And that matters to us, even though we're just Enfield residents that only see whatever's going on here. Um, what's going on in the world matters to us because we feel mor morally obliged to do it in our very privileged position. Climate change doesn't just cause extreme weather. It makes it more regular and amplifies its effects despite the loss of life and destruction the government around the world continue to invest in fossil fuels with the uk subsidizing the highest in europe what this means is that even though people are dying and that nature is being destroyed the government are still actively encouraging the burning of poisonous fossil fuels into the atmosphere it is well known that if we don't take immediate action on our climate we will reach our what scientists call the point of no return by that point any action i mentioned earlier is insignificant and futile because as I mentioned earlier, continents such as Africa and South America face the worst and most pressing effects of climate change, even though these countries have done the least to cause it. And this kind of sim uh, there's like a bit parallel to young people, even though that we have done the least to cause climate change, we are going to be feeling the effects. So together with the third world, we have something in common. And that's actually quite harsh. And this is because um, the UK has already reached its it's what they call the carbon limit, the point where CO2 emissions start to cause permanent irreversible damage to the climate. We actually did this in 1945. And so this isn't actually a conversation between calling me youth, this is actually calling everyone else on this call youth, because for I and most of uh, people on, the, on this call was even born or even matured to actually do something. Uh, we were both pushed beyond the point where our climate was hurting. This means that our missions since then have been at an exposure and at the expense of our planet. We cannot expect developing countries to eliminate their whole carbon footprint if the UK is not prepared to do so. That is why continents like Europe and North America must urgently take responsibility for what they have caused. Small islands are drowning, in, are drowning under the rising sea levels causing by our emissions. Coastal towns are worldwide are having the highest risk. The climate wipes homes off of this earth, destroys community and obliterates areas of natural beauty. I know this sounds dramatic, but the planet is living and its life is at stake. What climate change is inherently is a global issue, intergenerational, as which was mentioned before. 
the lungs of this planet, the atmosphere, the rainforest continues to be destroyed tree by tree. Undiscovered species and planets become extinct and we can see natural beauty. And yes, we can do things about this. In many pe in UK, in Enfield even, we believe that we are far from any of these effects and chopping down trees, that's got nothing to do with us. This is far from the truth. The residents of Fairburn in North Wales are set to be the first UK's uh, climate refugees coming up in the next year. And areas such as Richmond, Richmond have experienced high floodings, uh, with some people actually having to leave their houses. Young people have told stories about moving their schools and changing their future just because of the effects of the climate. And more recently, on August the 2nd, the Arctic Circle faced the biggest loss of ice ever, raising sea levels globally and increasing the height of the Thames. But on a local level, where Enfield Youth Parliament and Enfield over 54 and set up, we will be flooded more regularly and the pollution will increase the already large health inequality in the borough. Our borough in particular has a massive effect and um, the, he the Ill health inequality is humongous. Um, and I would actually say thanks to forums like this and work such as the work done by Deputy Mayor Nevea, um, climate change has really been getting on the map. Um, so it's really important that we basically take action on this. And speaking to young people, they'd like me to say this, so this is my final message I'd like to give to everyone. The young people representing schools from all over the borough have discussed this issue and has proposals um, which could actually be taken on locally to make a big difference. But one thing that was clear is that young people do care. Uh, I heard concerns about devastating impacts of climate change that happened around the globe, but also an unease and kind of really big discomfort about how we, here we live in Enfield. It's not my generation's fault, but it's my generation who will live with the consequences. So I challenge everybody in this room to come up with ideas for Enfield's climate strategy that will let the children of Enfield enjoy clean air, that will have them sit by the riversides and enjoy actually a park, um, as well as not dying as young as they need to be. We are in a generation where our age expects she should be going up, not down. We all need to work together to save the planet. Both mature and young people can work together, as Tony was mentioning earlier on. And it is obvious from my perspective here that similar amounts of passions is happening and relentless campaigning. Therefore, from the, this point on, I'm working on setting up an intergenerational forum, hopefully joining the Over 50s Forum and the Enfield Youth Parliament for four times, four, three times a year to discuss all these issues like climate change that we can't waste not working as a team and pushing for change together. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for inviting me to the NCAF meeting. Um, and, and thank you, Tony, for allowing me to join your meeting as well. Um, and Theo, um, thank you for your amazingly passionate uh, speech. I would be, I am in contact with the Youth Parliament and I've met your chair, but I would, I would be delighted to um, host you guys once we are able to have visitors at Parliament um, to talk about well, how I can work with you to bring, to make um, some of what you've said a reality, um, but also to carry your voice uh, to Parliament on the issues you've raised. Um, so that uh, the threat that Francis says doesn't come. <laughs> no, um, but no, thank you very much. Um, just on 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 the uh, on the environment, and and I'm sure everyone will agree. Our immediate attention um, focuses on responding to coronavirus pandemic at the moment, but we continue to live through a climate and environment emergency. And according to the UN, we have under 10 years left to avoid the worst impacts of catastrophic climate change. Given this, I believe we need to bring forward the most ambitious green recovery plan in the world. The flash floods, the deadly landslides that caused the traffic and the, the derailment of the of the train recently, the wildfires that we see across the world, we've seen over the recent years, make it clear that the climate breakdown is not a distant threat, but something that is happening here and now. Yet, while Parliament declared an environment and climate emergency in uh, May last year, our government is simply not responding to the situation uh, that is required. It's not responding, it's not providing the response that we need as a country. We need to work to provide jobs for those displaced by coronavirus by creating almost like a, a zero carbon army to take on vital work such as, you know, the home insulations. We know that homes are the source of um, emissions, a major source of emission in the country. 
making zero emission vehicles, producing renewable energy, planting trees, cultivating our green spaces and redesigning and improving our town centres and cities, um, including by adapting them to uh, for more walking and cycling. So focus on reducing our carbon footprint while also, while also improving the quality of life uh, enjoyed by people across the country. This also means that the conditions on financial support to save companies um, force them to adhere to environmental requirements. When we look at the um, bailouts um, and the financial support that was provided to many companies across Europe, European countries put conditions on them. But here in UK, we don't put any conditions. So this is a missed opportunity. And then it's, it's an opportunity that the government can still um, and should actually utilise. So the government states that it intends to deliver a greener UK economy and that it's taken steps to meet its target on net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it's uh, by 2020, it's going to meet it by 20, sorry, by 2050. I've, unfortunately, and I'm sure most people in the, in the meeting tonight know that the Committee uh, on Climate Change, a recent progress report on emission reduction, makes it clear that the gap between a current net zero target and the action needed to achieve it remains far too great. So even meeting this target falls short of the ambition we need. We must act with far greater urgency aiming to achieve most of our emission reduction within the next decade. Not only, uh, not only are ministers set to miss the 2050 target that the parliament legislated for just over a year, a year ago, they're not even on track to meet the less ambitious one that, that preceded it. So confronted by this unfolding emergency, I'm clear that 2050 is far too late for the UK to end its contribution to climate breakdown and the runaway global heating. According to UN, we, as I said, we have less than 10 years to deal with this catastrophic change. So our government must act with far greater urgency and ambition. Um, I'm determined that you can, must and can show low, uh, global leadership on this issue. And if it starts with, um, if we, you know, if we start with this ambition, with this ambition action at home, then we will be in a better place to actually support the rest of the world to re help reduce their uh, emissions as well. Um, and I think we, it, this is a perfect time for the government to come up with a Green New Deal. So. Um, with that, I support many of the aims um, set out in the climate in, in the ecological emergency bill that's coming forward that um, Francis mentioned. I would also be supporting the opposition's own uh, parliamentary agenda on the climate emergency, um, which will be developed in consultation with stakeholders, including the climate movement, trade unions, businesses and communities across the country which will include many of the principles laid out in this bill. And I think it's really important that it's developed in consultation with all these stakeholders, um, because one of the biggest fears when we're talking about um, the climate change and ecology and the changes that need to happen, uh, the biggest fear that people have is that it will leave people behind, it will affect the worst off most. So it is really important that we do have the unions, the businesses, um, and, and the communities, and, and, and the campaigners around the table when we are developing this, uh, this bill. Um, more immediately, my focus is on ensuring that the government seizes the once in a generation opportunity presented by the need to rebuild in the aftermath of the pandemic. So to rapidly decarbonize our economy through a green recovery. We can't go back to what it was before. This, we must seize on this opportunity. It's, it's, it's the right time to do it. Seizing the opportunity as other advanced economies are doing requires more than just the rhetoric that we're hearing from ministers. It requires a, 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 a plan. 
Uh, we need a plan now so that we can invest in green industries of the future, put people back to work in good green jobs across the country and support workers and communities as we make the transition to a low carbon and socially just e uh, economy. With a plan like that, we can raise our domestic climate ambition with a significantly enhanced 2030 emission reduction target and also demonstrate real leadership as the host of the, uh, the COP26 20, 20, uh, climate conference in Glasgow, which we are hoping will still go ahead next year, but not quite sure. So protecting our climate and nature is not only a necessity to ensure our collective future, it goes hand in hand with fostering our economy and ensuring decent living standards and quality of life for our populations. Um, and locally, um, I know that Enfield are uh, making huge efforts and I will be supporting the council and the councillors and the community and the civil society uh, in, our, in our borough to ensure that we are doing our part here in Enfield. Um, so we have a long way to go. There is a lot to be done. But the post-pandemic uh, time is an opportunity that I hope the government will seize and start making the change. Thank you very much for letting me join the meeting today. But I have to say uh, ever such a fantastic thank you to Theo and Ferial. I've never had such a wonderful introduction to climate change as from the, the both of you. So thanks ever so much. Uh, fantastic job there. Um, so I'm going to be talking specifically now about what we as individuals can do about climate change. As you know, I'm the founder of NoCO2.org. We plant trees. And the subject today is, is very specifically, what can we as individuals do about the climate crisis? So we, things have moved on hugely just since the beginning of 2019 when things were looking really, really very bad. And I think now where we are in this comment here, we do want to stop global warming, don't we? What I'm picking up on is that the, the sense I've got is that absolutely people do want to do something about climate change. And it's a matter of, of what to do. But there are blockages. Now, I just encourage people just for a minute to think about what those sort of blockages might be. So my list of blockages is, first of all, people are pretending that all is OK when it's not. Already people have talked about some, some numbers here. I, I would say we're on track for three degrees or more of global warming. And moreover, three degrees is now actually the default. So that really, unless we do something, unless people stand up and take action, then the default is that it's three degrees or more because there's just not the energy, there's not the momentum to stop it. So second thing that's going on here is, is fear of change. Everybody's afraid of change. People love their habits. People love what they do. They love driving around their cars. They love the little um, uh, shortcuts they do and everything. They're used to all of that. But if we look at the, 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 what's going on in the news, global warming is all over the news. And it's very easy with the news to say, well, look, the news, it's really all about others. I mean, it's somewhere else. It, it's, it's in tropics in Africa, it's America, which always has crazy weather. It's not actually about us. But I'm totally with Theo here that now, I mean, I'm a little bit older than Theo, but most of us on this call here will have seen the weather changing from when, even a few years ago, when we were younger. I mean, we now have a situation where we have these warm winters, which are really nice. I mean, I hated the cold winters, but the, the warm winters are part of global warming and the crazily hot summers like we had um, just early on in August. So the weather is changing, but the future is even more frightening. We've talked about sea levels. Do we really want to see rising sea levels? Droughts, floods, crop shortages. Do we really want all of this stuff? And so essentially we're at a crossroads. We're at a point where we have to do something. I want to talk about a couple of traps here. These, this is where people find out a bit about global warming. Very quickly they get confused and as a result they do nothing. Now this doesn't help. In this situation to do nothing is as bad as to be a climate denier because nothing will happen. And the second one 
is people who say, right, well, I'm going to do something, I'll turn down the heating, stop using the car so much. But they stop doing that because basically what's happening is that their habits are too strong and their level of commitment is too low. So what I want to share with you is this, it's, it's, it's time to choose. It's absolutely, it's time for each of us as individuals to choose. And this is a very, very simple model about three steps. I mean, no one else really is talking about this, interestingly. I'm very happy to share this because this is three very, very easy steps that each of us can take to stop global warming. So the first thing to do is to look at yourself. This is not just an intellectual exercise. Look at yourself. Do we really, really want to choose to stop global warming? So this is something that's it's in our hearts. It's in our minds from what we see, and it's in our hearts. Do we really want to do something about this for all the right reasons? And if we do, then it's necessary to take action and to share, to share that action. By sharing the action, you're saying you commit and also you've got the wonderful opportunity of inspiring others. So what are these actions that you can take? If you look at the internet, there's loads and loads of different um, examples. Some of them are out of date now. This is, this is, I believe, is very up to date. It's very simple and straightforward. So first of all, do something, do multiple things that you're actually comfortable with. It doesn't help that you, you see people, um, you know, you see Extinction Rebellion yesterday in London, people getting arrested. If you're not comfortable with it, you are comfortable with that, and it's fine. If you're not comfortable with it, then don't even try and do that. There's lots of other things you can do. The small stuff we need to do anyway, turning the lights off, recycling, all of that. We have to do that anyway. What I'm talking about here is what are the five big key actions that we do. And the first one, which is very, very easy, it takes a few minutes on the phone, which is to switch your electricity to 100% clean or green electricity. Now, most people um, in the UK, the data is, most people are actually still on standard variable rate, which means that if you do switch your electricity, you will actually save money as well. And the second one is the, it's really the big one. This is all about the fossil fuels. It's we have to use less fossil fuels. So what can, what can we do? What can we each do to contribute to this? So rather than stop, I would say, look, my message is at the moment is really to, to do less. Less air travel is not difficult because a lot of people are concerned about flying, etc. But really, can you leave the car at home? And then in time, not to rush out to get an electric car, but in time when you change your car, can you get an electric car? My friend Colin gets a new car every three years. He insists on getting a diesel. And I was so irritated with him. I did the calculation. That, that diesel car, probably over its lifetime, it causes 5,000 pounds worth of environmental damage because of the, the, the CO2 emissions over a 15 year life of a diesel car. The, the environmental damage is just massive. Turn down the heating, put in home insulation. Vegetarian meals are good. And then the third one, this is, this is one that's really, really important because here, on number two, you can do something. You can, you, can reduce, you can reduce to some extent. But when you talk about removing your carbon footprint, you can actually remove the whole of your carbon footprint. And you can do this very, very simply by planting trees. I'm going to talk more about this in a minute. Uh, but also important is to join an organization, uh, get involved where, where they're doing work on global warming, fighting the environment, and again, to share. And part of sharing is talking with people. So actions I took, just highlight a couple here. I've gone carbon neutral myself by donating to plant lots of trees. I mean, I planted three and a half thousand trees. Uh, that's for, for my wife, for myself, and another three and a half thousand for my wife. And that means that we are carbon neutral. And then the other thing is that I have done these um, uh, climate uh, marches myself. And of course, I've, I founded um, a no CO2 organization where we've planted 300,000 trees now. We, be nice to have planted more, but that's where we are today. So planting trees, as I say, you can go carbon neutral. Here are uh, trees being grown from seed in the tropics. And what's particularly important about planting trees is, as I say, you can actually remove all of your carbon footprint. So trees are proven, easy, very effective. And for, if you're UK average, then it requires, you need to put in place 1,750 trees. And with those trees, they will, on average, they'll remove your carbon footprint 
uh, for every year that the trees are growing, which is 20, 30 years. So we can plant those trees for you. I mean, I'm sorry, we're not able to plant those trees in Enfield for this price. That's a separate matter. But um, by planting the trees in the tropics, um, it's very, very cost effective. So we can do that for six pound a month over 36 months or 16 pound a month over 12 months. And this additional benefit um, of every hundred trees creates a day of paid work for families in extreme poverty, as well as a habitat for animals and birds. There's a couple of um, expert references here for um, why trees. Um, Christiana Figueres, who headed the Paris negotiations in 2015, She's saying that um, few actions are as critical or as urgent as planting trees. And the UK Committee for Climate Change, um, they are saying, I was reading this today, they're saying there's clear economic, social, and environmental benefits for tree planting. Very interesting what they're saying. Their, their report is worth reading because it's clear, I mean, they are saying that the government is not doing enough. So reasons why people should get involved. There's a lot of reasons why people should do, for example, to provide a better future for our children and our grandchildren. And the last one here is the one I really like, is can we really stand by and allow global warming to wreck our planet and our future? So my ask to you is really, would you like to join in? What would you like to do to help? What are these ideas here? Is there anything that you'd like to do to join in and help? So thank you very much. Uh, Fariel has actually already said most of my presentation and in a much more dynamic um, mode than I could have done myself, but uh, I'll still give you a quick presentation on what Better Streets for Enfield is. Right, uh, Better Streets for Enfield is a group of Enfield residents who are campaigning to improve our streets. There's uh, over a thousand people um, in our Facebook group and um, We've been developing various, we're, we're in um, dialogue with the council about various things uh, and we're making a certain amount of progress with getting them to go along with our agenda. What we're campaigning for is safer streets, healthier streets that aren't polluted, not just by um, exhaust fumes, but also by the noise and the danger, both of which are very serious stressors. And what this amounts to is people friendly streets. Now, we're just part of a growing movement across the country and across the world to um, take back our streets. Uh, Living Streets, which is one of these uh, associated groups, is actually goes back to 1929 when they were called the, the, the Pedestrians Association and it, they lobbied for and successfully got pedestrian crossings and, and speed limits, which didn't exist previously. So all, all these things anyway are very nice. And I'm sure that uh, I hope that most of you agree with them, but they all pale into insignificance compared with the threat of climate change. So as it happens, our agenda the things that we're campaigning for fit in very well with the need to decarbonize our streets. This graph comes from the Climate Action Plan, which has been produced by the council. 39% of carbon emissions are from transport. Of those, private cars are a major um, part of those emissions. Now you might say that engines are becoming much more fuel efficient over the years which is true. At the same time, people have been buying bigger and bigger cars and SUVs, and this has completely cancelled out uh, these improvements. So are electric cars the answer? Well, they're part of the answer, obviously, because they, um, they have the potential to be fueled by um, zero carbon electricity. But at the moment, we don't have zero. In entirely zero and zero carbon electricity and it'll be quite a while before we do. Also, it's going to take a long time to change the vehicle fleet from petrol and diesel to electric for all sorts of reasons. And thirdly, just manufacturing these cars creates emissions. Um, 
what's called embodied carbon. And those cars that have created all these emissions when they're being manufactured, they're only in use for like five or 10% of the time. The rest of the time, they're just parked, they're wasted asset. So it's far better to use that manufacturing capacity to build new buses and new trains, which will be in use for a much longer amount of time. So electric cars, only part of the answer. We don't need to wait until various government pl um, plans come through. We need to get started now. We need to phase out petrol and diesel vehicles urgently, which doesn't necessarily mean we have to, st to stop using them completely immediately. While we've still got them, we can just use them less. And you might find that your life, you might expect your life to get worse because of that, but you might actually be surprised and find that you prefer things that way. Ferriol's already talked about this. We need to both make it slightly more inconvenient and unattractive to drive cars, but at the same time, and a little bit in advance, we need to make it more attractive and easier and healthier to use the alternatives. Um, so these are some of the steps that we can use to get there. We can provide better uh, infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists. So more crossings, um, proper cycle lanes along all main roads. As Ferriol said, we need to make it harder to park, especially on, along main roads. Uh, because if there's nowhere to park, then there's no point in driving your car to get there. We need um, to new, new housing and office developments need to be built around low car or zero car usage. We need to start charging road users for the, the real cost of, of the damage that they're doing to the environment by using smart user road charging. And we, used, and we need to greatly improve public transport. Um, these are some of the obstacles, and the, and the biggest one is the first one, public opposition, which Ferriol mentioned. People are so used to driving cars, they think that they can't possibly do without it. Um, this is going to be the most difficult uh, thing to get round. It is possible to live without a car. I've never learned to drive. Um, it hasn't caused me any big problems at all. So uh, that's my time. Thank you, Francis.